the realm of spirit. It is nature which teaches all things. She receives of the pure spirit that instructs her. Everything coming from the light of nature must be learned except for the image of potentiality. Man is given creativity and potentiality for he possesses life and spirit. The Kabbalah is actually an intensified development of the teachings of an earlier oriental mystical trend and centers around two basic problems. One, how to reconcile the relation of spirit, the most exalted and most spiritual being, to the gross materialistic world. Two, how could such a spiritual being create a material world and from where did the earthen matter come? The solution to these problems is best expressed by one word, mediation, which means there are mediators between spirit in the material world by means of which the true relations are carried out. The mediators have been identified differently in our past ages as angels, as powers of God embodied in the letters of the alphabet, or as occult allegorical powers called Sephiroth. The true essence of spirit in God, according to the Kabbalah, is unknown. We only know pure spirit is unlimited and infinite. It is accordingly denominated in the Ein Sof, endless, and it must, however, reveal itself to the world and to the mind of man. To review, there are ten manifestations of power in media of spirit called Sephiroth, these are Kether, the crown, Hulkmah, wisdom, and Bina, love and understanding, forming the first triad, which relates to pure being, Chesed, kindness, Gevora, power, and Tifereth, beauty and glory, which are moral qualities, Netzach, victory, Hod, splendor, and Yeshod, foundation representing the world of nature, and Malkuth, leadership, which harmonizes the nine active principles and acts as the medium between the Sephiroth and other links in the great chain of being and existence. The Sephiroth are the instruments by means of which spirit created the world and through which it is manifest to the world. Pure spirit, per se, is then a diffusive, non-atomic, uncreated, formless, self-existent being. It is silent, motionless, unconscious, and possesses in its sublime purity only one attribute expressible in human language. This is absolute and unconditioned potentiality or creativity. Such is the realm of spirit, which for the sake of linguistic convenience was termed by the occultist the realm of unmanifested being. We do not have to deal with the first emanation of this in inconceivable state. Yet the Kabbalah contains many long and elaborate treatises upon the various emanations of all ten Sephiroth. These are, for the most part, written in such an allegorical style as to be useless to most Western readers. Even the Oriental mind finds them somewhat unsatisfactory and in many respects totally misleading. The first emanation or manifestation from this realm of formless being and power claims the reader's closest attention. It forms the keynote of the entire divine anthem of creation. This emanation, called by Kabbalists Kether, the crown, when stripped of its allegorical and mystical veil, is the simple and naked activity of pure motion. Thus, we see the first action of the unconscious mind is thought, and thought implies a vibration or motion. At the very moment the deific mind vibrates with thought, there springs forth from the infinite womb of divinity the duality of all future greatness. This duality is the Kabbalistical twins, Hulkmah and Bina, of love and wisdom. In turn, 
They mean the attributes attraction and repulsion, of pure force and pure motion. They are male and female, co-equal and co-eternal, and express themselves as activity and repose. No matter how recondite or abstruse our speculations may be, when the orbit of our metaphysical mediation is complete, we find ourselves face to face once again with our original starting point. This is the infinite triad of love, wisdom, and crown. In other words, this triad is the one primal force of pure being containing unlimited potentialities within itself. With this divine trinity, we, as investigators of nature's occult mysteries, must rest contented. We console ourselves whenever necessary with the certain knowledge that the nearer we appear to approach the great white throne of the infinite, the farther the divine center recedes from us. If this were not so, there could be no eternity for the atoms of differentiated life. Consequently, the immortality of the soul would be an empty dream or a mere figment hatched by some evil and infernal power within the overheated imagination of poor, deluded mankind. Before going any further, the reader should commit to memory the following doctrines. These are taught by the occult initiates of all true wisdom. They are doctrines to us in our present mortal state, since we cannot demonstrate them externally by any known form of scientific experiment. Number one, the whole universe is filled with the pure, motionless, formless spirit of creative and pure divinity. Number two, the universe is boundless and unlimited, a circle whose circumference is everywhere and whose center is nowhere. The universe is a duality and consists of the manifest and the non-manifest. The life principle emanates from the pure vortices of the central spiritual sun of the manifest universe. From this mighty, inconceivable center of life emanate spiritual rays which are scintillating with activity. The vast, motionless void, the awful universe of silent, formless spirit, now becomes alive with an infinite number of subordinate universes. The rays at various points in space are brought into focus. At these points or foci are formed the centers of smaller universes. An example of this great process may be seen upon our material plane by observing how primary suns throw off a series of secondary suns. These secondary suns then throw off the planets. The planets now become the parents of the moons. The science of correspondence states, as it is above, so it is below. Remember well these basic doctrines. The divine purpose of all creation is the differentiation of the unconscious formless one. The grand outcome of this great purpose is the ultimation of intelligencies. Then separate minds reflect the idea of the universal mind and conscious individualized mentalities possess immortal souls capable of eternal progression. They are differentiated life atoms which become of themselves secondary factors in the arbitrators of the destinies of manifold worlds. The process of creation are duality of involution and evolution. The one is inseparable from the other. Paradoxical as it may appear to the uninitiated, it is a divine truth that the evolution and ultimation of spiritual life is accomplished only by a strict process of involution. It is from the without to the within, or from the infinitely great to the infinitely small. To better understand this mystery, we must use a series of symbols. Accordingly, we conceive the divine focus of the primal essence to the spiritual center of a universe. This ray constitutes a triune from which emanates the pure white light of the formless one. This center constitutes a realm of Sephiroth, a sun sphere of living potentialities, pure divine beings infinitely beyond the highest archangelhood. As such, we conceive of it as floating, as if it were a speck in the infinite ocean of divine love, surrounded by the effulgent 
brightness of the nameless crown. This divine sphere is completely passive in such a stage. Nirvana reigns upon with the blissful radiance of its motionless bosom. But the time approaches when its great mission in the scheme of creation must begin. The moment arrives, and as the first creative pulsation of thought in the whole sphere of motionless, formless, soft light flashes forth. It is sparkling with living spiritual energy. Now behold what a change has taken place. The soft white light has ceased and in its place there goes forth in every conceivable direction the mighty oceans of force, each ocean differing in its velocity, color, and potentiality. The passive has now become active, the motionless has commenced to move, and the void of space is transversed upon the wings of light. The sun has become refracted, and a portion of the infinite light is decomposed into its original unlimited attributes. This is related in the mystical allegorical language of the Kabbalah as the evolution of seven active Sephiroth from the first trinity of love, wisdom, and crown. It is these seven active Sephiroth which constitute the seven principles of nature. They form seven points or subcenters around their divine parent center, the spiritual sun. These are the seven states of angelic life from whose divine spiritual matrix issue all the life atoms of their created universe. When the dawn of any universe commences, the pure formless essence is indrawn before being involved by the deific will of the angelic hierarchies. It is indrawn from the realms of unmanifested into the sun sphere of creative life. By this contact, it immediately undergoes a great change. It is formless no longer, but atomic and endowed with the attribute or state of polarity. This polarity evolves a sort of partnership and equally divides the formless substance into two basic parts. Each part is a necessary attendant upon the other in manifested existence. One is positive, the other negative. The positive ray is that which constitutes the living spiritual fire of all things. Its atoms are infinitely fine. The negative ray is ever tending towards a state of rest or inertia. Its atoms are coarse and loose when compared with those of the positive ray. It is the substance formed by the negative ray which constitutes every species of what is called matter. It forms all from the inconceivably fine etherealized substance which composes the forms of the divine archangels of the sun down to the coarse mineral veins of dense heavy metal. Therefore, when speaking broadly of spirit and matter, the terms are perfectly meaningless in an occult sense. That which we call spirit is not pure spirit, but only the positive or acting attribute of that which we term matter. Hence, matter is so far unreal. It is only an appearance produced by the negative ray, and this appearance is the result of polarity or of more motion. One is straight and penetrating, the other is round and enfolding. With this necessary digression, we resume our discussion. From the seven angelic states mentioned before, spiritual involution commences. Each one of the seven spheres is a reflection of one of the seven refracted principles which constitute the divine mind. From this reflection springs forth angelic races second only in mental power and potentiality to their parents. Then, in turn, there are produced still lower celestial states, each state of sphere corresponding in nature, color, and attributes to the sphere from which it was born or reflected. Though each state in the descending scale is similar by correspondence, it becomes less in size and more in material. The spiritual potencies of its angelic races are weaker and less active because they are more and more involved with matter as they descend the scale. Thus does involution proceed, involving state after state and sphere after sphere, 
forming a series of circles whose line of motion or descent is not in the plane of its orbit. Thus the form becomes as a spiral until the lowest point is reached. Beyond this point is impossible, and the infinitely great has become the infinitely small. This is the great polarizing point from which the material world is reflected. It is the lowest possible spiritual state of life which formed the first ethereal race of human beings upon our planet. Thus, it ushered into existence the famous golden age of mythological celebrity. There are thus two schools for man. The school of the earth, which teaches earthly things, has its schoolmistress nature, and is indeed nature herself. Insulates knowledge of itself and of those things which are in it. Then there is the other school, that from above. There the teacher is deific spirit. It teaches us in the reborn body, not in the old body. And in this reborn man, it teaches heavenly wisdom. What is there in us, mortals, which has not come to us from the Sephiroth? Whatever teaches us the eternal also teaches us the perishable for both spring from the realm of spirit. There are many who deem man and his power to be the highest good. There are men who consider the Malkuth to be the highest good or hold the highest good to be their fellow men who do them a good turn, give them gifts or help them. But in this they are mistaken. For is there not the triad love, wisdom and crown above the emperor? Is there not someone who gives to the man, who in turn gives you what you need? Is not this someone more? We may rise as high as we can in search of the highest good, but all this remains within the earthly sphere. That which is eternal is above all of this. If he who has the power is just in himself, the power must so subjugate him so that he is sadder than those under him. For power comes from spirit and bears the human burdens that derive from it. It follows that to each is given the spirit he desires, to one the spirit of wisdom, to another the spirit of science, to a third the spirit of faith, to a fourth the spirit of healing, to a fifth the spirit of power, to a sixth the spirit of prophecy, to a seventh the spirit of tongues. Thus God gives diverse things through spirit, and not just one, but many hundreds, so man may know how marvelous is the spirit from which all things came. Each is twofold. On the one hand, there is the knowledge we learn from men. On the other hand, the knowledge we learn from the spirit. The making of glass is not an art for him who has learned it from someone else. But he who was the first to invent it himself deserves to be praised as an artist, for in him we feel the action of spirit. But in him who can do only what he has learned from others, the presence of spirit cannot be felt. Man can do none of this by his own strength. All his wisdom, his reason, and everything that is in him cannot discover the new, let alone fully develop its properties. Those who learned from the first teachers learned directly from others, but they too lived by the Spirit, for it was put into those men, and it has thus come down from the first to the most recent man, and thus the Spirit triumphs on earth among men.